All righty. We are here with the one and only Mr. Jason Hornady from Hornady Manufacturing and Ammunition. <laughs> he smiles. How are we doing today, sir? Oh, we're doing good. Mr. Good. is a little strong. Uh, that's my father. <laughs> that's his father. But, you guys, anyway. uh, you guys at Hornady are spoiling us today. You, uh, you guys also have your own podcast and you have a really nice studio. So, uh, getting this set up was uh, a ton easier than what it normally is with some of our other guests. So yeah. shout to out to Preston. Yeah. Shout yeah. out to Preston. Uh, for yep. I don't think he can hear you. I don't think he can hear you, but he's smiling back there. So, well, we're uh, I'm excited to have you on, Jason. Um, you know, when I bought my first pistol, it was 2012. Uh, the Zombie Max ammo was the first ammo that I ever bought for it because it was cool at the time. He's he's laughing. Um, you know, between that and Critical Duty, um, and funny enough, I actually bought it right here at Vance Outdoors back when it was Buckeye Buckeye Outdoors. So, how yeah. things kind of go full circle. You know, I wasn't even expecting to even be in this industry, and yet here we are talking with you. So it's pretty cool how things end up working out. But before we get too far, man, let's go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about who you are, and then we'll dive into the history of Hornady. So I'm Jason Hornady. Um, I'm no generation here at Hornady. My grandfather started the company. Um, unbeknownst, I don't know if you guys know this, but I used to be a manufacturer's rep in Ohio. Yes. And so that's how the relationship I have with the Vance has started. So I've been in all those stores and done all that stuff, and that's why I say some of the flippant things about about them that I do and <laughs> about how they can be cheap and how I bait them into spending money. And it's funny because um, when we were getting ready to launch that zombie ammo, you mentioned, I called Todd and he goes, have you guys lost your mind? And I lost him on the call. I was driving from a ranch in Utah to a ranch in Wyoming during hunting season. And <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I remember him saying, have you lost your mind? And I lost him. And 20 minutes later, he called me back. He goes, I'll take as much as you let me have of the zombie ammo. I said, I thought you said I was going to lose my mind. And he said, well, I went by a couple of my guys and I said, zombie ammo. And my guys went, that'd be awesome. <laughs> and, uh, so that's, that's how zombie ammo came to be at Vance Buckeye and all those stores yeah. in Ohio. Yeah. That was cool. Cause that was right at the height kind of walking dead time too. It was really, really mm -hmm. popular at time. So you guys, you guys definitely took advantage of that for sure. We announced it on Halloween. And we started shipping it on the day of the debut, the, the season debut of Walking Dead. So we hyped all that, tied it all together. We had a lot of fun with that. That's marketing 101, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. <laughs> he smiled. Um, let's get a little bit more about yourself. So you said that you were you were a sales rep. Uh, that was uh, was that Duncan yep. Lewis? Um, that was Sportco Marketing. Okay. So funny. I'll tell you another funny story. So I met. Rich Vance and Todd Vance at the SHOT Show in 1993. It was my first rep job with Sportco. And about a month later, I was making dealer calls, and, and I was the low man on the totem pole, so I was doing a bunch of, of work that you give the newbies. Um, and I went in there to try and see Rich, and I walk in, and Jeff Snook, who is our rep today, um, was standing there, and I said, is Rich here? And he, yep. Well, can I talk to him? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, is Todd here? Yep. Well, can I talk to him? Nope. And I was, well, what do I need to do to talk to one of those guys? Um, you need to get an appointment or something, but you're not talking to him now. <laughs> and so I turned and left the store. And she's within six months. I was so comfortable in there that I didn't even stop and talk to anybody. I just walked straight <laughs> to the back room by then. I love it. But, uh, you know, never... <laughs> always be careful the toes you step on. You're never, you're never sure whose ass they're going to be attached to. And and uh, I like to remind Snook about that on a fairly regular basis now that he's basically calling on you guys in the job I used to have. That's awesome. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. did you, um, did, so have you always worked for the family or you said you obviously with the sales rep? No. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, I was a manufacturer's rep for Sporco marketing. And so we had Thompson center, we did have Hornady, we had Nikon. Um, and then I left Sportco and I went to be the sales manager director of sales and, man and marketing manager for Redfield Rifle Scopes. And that was in 1997. Um, Redfield was in trouble and I was part of the group that was hired to turn it around. And I was 26 years old and thought I was smarter than everybody and more capable than everybody. And it didn't matter how hard you worked. If, if you don't have a little bit of money to keep the doors open, you won't keep the doors open. So I got to ride that one into bankruptcy, which is a really good experience, but it's not one, it's one that, it's good to have, but you learn you never want to repeat it. Um, and so then I went to work for Duncan Lewis. And then when I was at Duncan Lewis, I 
I handled national accounts for them. Okay. Okay. So getting into Hornady, kind of let's get into the, the start of the company itself. You said with your grandfather and just kind of where it yep. picked up. I know it didn't start as um, what it is today. So if you kind of give us the history of Hornady, like when it started and, and kind of how it's progressed over the years. So my grandfather started with a guy named Vernon Spear. So that's probably a name that's familiar to you guys, Spear Bullets, yep. uh, PTI. Um, they started here in Grand Island, Nebraska. And the reason they were here in Grand Island, Nebraska is we had a the Cornhusker Army ammunition plant was here. And that's a bomb plant that was making bombs for World War II. And they were training the guards how to shoot. And so they would take the 22 rimfire cases. They weren't using anything but 22s because it was war and you couldn't get any of the materials. So they would take the, um, the fired 22 cases, turn the rims off, and then they'd melt down wheel weights from from tires or from wheels and um, fill the 22 cases and swedge them down to make bolts for 222s. The 223 didn't exist at the time. So they were making bolts for 222s. And um, after the war, they kind of kept going and Vernon decided he was going to move to Utah and took most of the equipment. And my grandfather was going to be sales and marketing, which that I still don't understand how that was ever going to work because he wasn't a sales and a marketer. He liked to manufacture stuff. He, he would probably dislike me uh, and my style, but uh, um, as a lot of those partnerships go, when especially when you don't live anywhere near one another, uh, that partnership failed, and my grandfather went on his own, and, um, started making bullets in 1949, the same year my dad was born. Um, he made bullets right up until he was killed going to the SHOT Show in a plane crash with two other employees. Interestingly, my dad was supposed to be on the plane with them, um, but my mom was in the hospital getting a kidney transplant, which in 1980, 81, uh, kidney transplant was a pretty radical surgery. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. And so my dad didn't go. Um, and so my grandfather was killed and then my dad, my aunt and my grandmother took over. Um, we had a deal where nobody in the family, you, you don't get a job just because you're part of the family. You have to work somewhere else and get relevant experience. And I say it's 10 years after you graduated from college. My dad says it's until you're 30. Um, regardless, I was out for 15 years before I came back. And so I've been back 16, going on 17 years now. I started here in 2006. Um, and and we've had a lot of really nice growth since then. And in 2001, we introduced the 17-inch MR, which really yep. took us from being a bullet company to – a bullet and ammunition company. We were always reloading components. Um, but when I got here, we added some dimensions to, to sales. And, and so we've made it, we've had a lot of good growth and, and we've had a lot of fun. You know, it's when, when you work in a family business, the, the good news and the bad news is um, sometimes you don't treat your boss like your boss. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. you, you just tell them, I don't really care what you said. I'm going to do it anyway. And um, that's kind of the way we've done it. I, you know, um, we're all about, I'm about selling. That's my background. So my way of making, making us grow is I just went and oversold what we could make and, and then blame my dad for it. So then he'd go <laughs> add production equipment and he'd get to a point where he could outproduce what we could sell. And he'd come down and say, are you going to sell something? And like, okay. And uh, so we kind of have this leapfrog love hate relationship, depending on, depending on which side of that argument you're on depends on who loves who and who hates who at the moment. I guess, I guess so, um, so over that history and, and, and that, you know, so you said manufacturing bullets in 1949, does that hear that right? Yep. Um, yep. there's been a lot of administrations come and go. There's been a lot of turmoil across the country come and go. There's been a lot of, um, issues in the industry that we work in, right? We just, it's like almost yeah. something, it's like something every year, right? How, how has Hornady been able to stay so successful over that period of time? What makes them different that it kind of lets them be successful over that period of time? Well, and it, it's funny. I went and spoke to a entrepreneurship class at, at the University of Nebraska yesterday. And so we covered a bunch of these topics. And um, number one, being a family business that's privately owned um, helps a lot. We're, yeah. we're a flat organization, as is Vance's. I mean, basically, you're three, maybe four people away from a final decision on yep. on some pre- pretty major decisions, and that and we like that. Um, and I had a kid in this go, well, do you let your employees come up with new product ideas? <laughs> well, yeah. We're, I don't know where anybody thinks they're going to come from. It's going to come from the 
the people that work here do it. Um, you know, you, you can't get too wrapped up into the politics and, and all that stuff. You, you just tell us the rules that we need, have to play by and we will play by them. And it, that can be for the politically sensitive stuff. It can be for OSHA. It can be for any of sure. the other regulatory agencies we deal with. And I saw letters from my grandfather to customers when the 1968 control gun control act came out. And, you know, it's, it's something that we have dealt with for 2024 will be our 75th year. So it's just one of those, okay, here's the, the cards we have and we'll play them the best we can and, and keep going. And, and we'd like to think of ourselves as a new product company. You, you guys know there's mm-hmm. companies that make ammunition that are far larger than we are. Um, sure but you probably can't come up with a whole lot of their new products in the last 20 years. And, uh, you've already named, yeah. you know, two of them that we've come up with between zombie and critical defense. So, um, we try to just keep pushing that envelope. That's what makes us different. You know, it, it, if you look at Vance's and Hornady, aside from the, the personal and family relationships as a vendor, what, what does Hornady have to do to help a retailer like Vance's and, what I have to do is I have to drive footsteps into your door. Sure. That's how I'm valuable to you guys is have something that makes somebody want to come to Vance's and buy it. Yep. And um, so we've had critical defense and critical duty and super performance and, and precision hunter. And, you know, we just introduced the, we're on our third PRC cartridge. We just launched last week. And um, you know, the reception on that is great. Well, you know what? They probably didn't come in this week to buy a seven PRC because we just announced it, yeah. mm-hmm. but they may have come in to learn about it. And while they were there, they probably bought a holster and a box of ammo. And sure. so, so that, you know, that's kind of how we look at things is number one, we sell fun. Yeah. This is, we're a hobby industry. This is fun. And you guys sell fun. You yep. sell more fun than we do. Cause you get to sell the whole gamut of hobbies. Um, but if you're going to sell fun, you need to make it fun and you need to have fun while you're in it. And, uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously either. No, yeah, no, yeah. You're, I, I'm glad you said that too with the PRC because that, you know, they may not come in to buy the PRC because you just looked at it, but the guy that owns a PRC or seven mil PRC rifle probably has about 17 other ones that he can also buy ammunition for <laughs> mm-hmm. too. So that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I mean, guns, guns are like women's shoes. You can never have too many. You ask your <laughs> wife or girlfriend. I mean, you look at their shoe closet and it's like, have you ever even worn those pairs of shoes? <laughs> no, but the same with I mean, We've all got a gun or two that we've probably never shot. Oh yeah. So, sure. uh, but, but, but it's mine. So you touched on the, on the company allowing other, you know, employees, engineers. I know that's how 17 HMR was developed. Like one of the engineers kind of came up with it. Right. Um, yeah. What does the process look like when you start, maybe like start to finish on something like that. How many iterations do you go through or like how crazy is it to have an employee come up to you and say, Hey, I've got an idea for the new, you know, the new line. So new products. Um, we have a new products committee that is loosely based on a couple guys from engineering, a couple guys from marketing, me, my dad, um, you know, one or two people from sales, depending. Sometimes there's a guy from tech. There's a, we try to always have a manufacturing guy in there. One of the things about new products, you can come up with all kinds of new products, but if you can't manufacture it, it doesn't do anybody any good. Um, and so we'll sit there and if somebody has a new idea that's not necessarily part of that group, they, they'll either talk to somebody they know that's part of the group or they'll come in and say, Hey, I was kind of thinking we should do this. And a lot of times they've, they've made a part or, or they've got a sketch. I don't care if it's on a napkin and we all kind of sit around and say, well, that's kind of cool. And if we think it's cool, then, you know, Hey, run with it. If it's not cool, then it probably gets back burned or it goes and gets tweaked. Some of those things could get tweaked for years. We've got a, a reloading, a piece of reloading equipment that is going to be badass. And I think they're probably on iteration 27. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, the the new muzzle loading bullet we just introduced the long range um, ELDX muzzle loader bullet yep. I think we went on four iterations so um, and that was the kid who designed it he was the advocate for it and now we have a bullet that shoots you know four tenths of an inch at a hundred yards that's 
awesome. Yeah. That's good. And yeah. I mean, sometimes it's muzzle loader. Sometimes it's simple. Yeah, muzzle loader bullet. But long range is hot right now, and it doesn't yeah. matter if it's in rim fire, which we don't make, or if it's in um, muzzle loading. Clearly, because these, these guys are eating it up. But it it doesn't matter. Um, sometimes it's a really easy product launch. Frankly, you'll love this. Zombie was under 30 days from when we decided to do it to shipping. Wow. <laughs> yep, under 30. Did, and, you, uh, did you already have a hollow point like bullet like already ready to go that that was kind of that because it had the polymer insert correct is that it's like that rubber yeah so i'll tell you the story um, <laughs> begrudgingly that is the year we were going to launch critical duty okay and so we started with critical defense and critical defense was primarily you know concealed carry self-defense up close and personal and our guys said there's no way we could ever do uh, an FBI protocol bullet in that style. And when I started, my dad basically gave me a whole bunch of topic or a bunch of projects he wanted me to work on and gave them to me. And I, I think I probably was being a little cocky and I was like, yeah, okay. None of that sounds that hard. And then at the very end he goes, and I want you to win an FBI contract. Oh boy. So I, I started pushing on our guys to come up with an FBI bullet. It started as critical defense. We found a way to do critical duty, which it is far and away the best bullet for law enforcement, for full-size pistols that, that we've ever made. It, it does exactly what those requirements are. And when we were going to launch it, we had debates on whether we should take it commercial or whether we should take it law enforcement only. You know, what should we do? How do you do this? And I wanted to take it commercial, and my dad just wasn't, wasn't sure. And uh, because there is something about marketing just to law enforcement that gets those guys cranked up too. Yeah. But, um, I was on my way down to argue with him about, cause we had to come, we had to decide what we were going to do and what we weren't. And I was on my way down to argue with him about it. And I stopped in, um, Neil Davies and Renee Waltemath's offices. And I said, I'm going down to have the, the final, final fight. And they both looked at me and said, whatever you do, don't agree to zombie. So I walked down to my dad's office and I laid out my plan on critical duty and, he finally looks at me at the very end. He goes, well, I think you're right. And I think, I think we should do critical duty. Take a commercial. You go. As long as we do zombie. <laughs> oh, man. And that was his idea from the very get-go. So as long as we do zombie. And I looked at him and I said, fine. But if we do it, we're gonna, it's going to be totally fun. We're not putting in the price list. We're not putting in the catalog. We're not, you know, and I'm just like, we're doing this. We're doing that. And it's cartoonish packaging. And I'm just kind of. I laid out all these conditions. He goes, fine, that's perfect. Let's go. <laughs> and I went back down the hall, kind of hanging my head. I walked into Neil's office and I said, I got good news. We're doing duty. Yep, we're doing duty. And we're doing zombie. We better get that going because I don't want it in the catalog, the price list or anywhere else. And I think we need to do a promo video. And literally after they sulked, both he and Renee sulked for about two hours. Then we sat down and we came up with a plan. And um, it was the first time we'd ever done a teaser video which if, if you saw it at the time, it yeah. was so much fun. I think I remember it. It all, all tied in with Walking Dead. And, yep. and a bunch of our employees went and dressed up like zombies, and they filmed a couple of videos, and it was a lot of fun. And if, if our competitors knew how much zombie ammo we sold in the, the first two weeks, they, would, <laughs> they wouldn't have made as much fun of me for having the product. Oh, it's great. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's a classic for me. Like, it's yep. a classic for me, for sure. I mean, I love it. Um, so that's where that came from getting into getting into some other, other tech. I didn't actually have this written down, but I kind of have it on my mind that you've seen, um, whether it shows like meat eater or some of these other, uh, bigger, bigger shows they're running. You, you mentioned long range. This is why I brought it up. Um, the, these copper, these copper bullets have become a new hot thing right now. And I just didn't know like where you guys kind of stood on that. And just kind of the, the projection, um, the projection for copper, if you will, and just more of a long range precision stuff. Um, so last year we introduced our CX line of bullets that have the heat shield tip. Yeah. Um, and that's in our outfitter line. And I, I don't know where we are in, in market leadership. I got to believe that probably between us and Barnes are the two largest producers of, of copper solid bullets. I, I will tell you that, Lead is the best bullet-making material on the planet, with the exception of gold. 
Um, gold just is a little bit more expensive. I just, yeah. um, copper is great, and guys guys like it. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's not as dense as lead, and and you know heavier weight bullets for longer range you know, just work better. Now, the copper bullets are hard; they perform very well, and if guys like them. We want to be the guy who makes whatever bullet the customer wants, and yep. so we're going to make them. Um, there's certainly parts of the world, California, um, you have to use them. Sure. And so our goal is to make the best solid copper bullet or the best long-range bullet or whatever it is that, that people make. So it, it really isn't anything new. It, you know, the Barnes, Barnes bullets have been around for, shit, since I can remember, 40 years. Um, it's just been in the last 15 or so that the, the rest of us have kind of started making them. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you said it. If you're going to make it, you might, you might as well make it the best you possibly can. Right. I mean, what, there's no sense in trying to, yeah, we're going to make the best. The CX profiles basically match our ELDX profile, basically, not always, but basically. And, um, the, the thing you have to remember too is, is so if you have a, 165 grain CX because you've removed lead and replaced it with copper. The profile is going to be of a heavier weight lead core bullet. So the 165 would basically match up with our 180 in a lead in an EODX. Um, cause you're just losing that high mass material. You're substituting it with a low mass material. All right, everyone. We need to take a quick break to thank our show sponsor, Toby Burdett with Burdett taxidermy and legends, big game recovery. As we mentioned several times on the show, when it comes to whitetail hunting, bad shots just happen. If you're in Ohio or the surrounding states and you find yourself in a situation where you need help tracking, give Toby a call at 740-281-6435. Thanks everyone and good luck this hunting season. All right guys, we're in that time of year when everyone is looking for a great deal. Did you know that we still have Black Friday deals going on? We have great prices on firearms, ammo, even Traeger grills, and much, much more. Sale prices will be valid until December 4th, so make sure you stop into one of our locations or shop online at vanceoutdoors.com. Thanks, everyone. Now let's get back to the conversation. Um, Switching gears here and kind of getting away from bulls just a little bit. Um, I know you guys like to go out west, or you you are west to us. You like to go out on the hunts, so... (laughs) Going on a lot of different hunts. We are in the Go ahead. we're in the true Midwest. Yeah. Oh. I consider Ohio mid east. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. We are within that five hundred mile <laughs> range in New York, so it's it's all good. Um, you are in Eastern time zone. With uh, with your relationship with Todd and, and everyone and and all those hunts, has there been like a favorite hunt for you? Not necessarily with them, but just in general that you guys have gone on. I know you go just about every year. Um, you know. The one that is the most memorable um, is I got to go to that that ranch that we all go to in Utah. Sure. But it was in two th- in two thousand one. Um, I got rewarded by my boss at the time an opportunity to go out there, and the hunt was supposed to start on September twelfth. Um, so September twelfth, two thousand one, was quite an odd yeah. time, and we didn't get the hunt. We didn't get to leave until September 13th. We drove, um, but there were supposed to be, I think, 30 hunters on the ranch, and I think there was 10, and um, clearly there were no planes flying. There was no – you just had this large place to hunt that was very unique. It it is unique, but you don't realize how much ambient noise there is from airplanes and stuff and – just the world and it was the leaves were changing and and we got to leave the world behind and it was just a perfect deal it's the first time i'd ever been around that many elk and so it is the most memorable hunt of my lifetime because it was so quiet and then while we were out there that one little tv that they they did in the lodge and all the other guys that were out there they could afford to be there i i the only reason i was there is my boss paid for yeah. the trip and um uh, they turned, I don't remember what day they turned the stock market on, but there were two of us that were there that uh, my boss had paid for. And those guys, everybody stayed in the lodge to see what happened when the stock market opened and neither one of us had any money. So we went hunting and that day I killed a 360 bull elk, which is the best I've ever killed. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't try a whole lot 
harder after that, but it's hanging on the wall in my living room. And, uh, that is, that is the one trophy that will stay with me. And if they move me into a rest home someday, they will <laughs> come with cool. me. <laughs> That's an awesome story, man. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It, it, you know, it was a it certainly I mean, horrible yeah. times, but it was a unique, unique thing in an odd time. Um, I like mule deer. I really think they're cool. Um, but just anytime you get to go, I, we were up in South Dakota pheasant hunting. Preston was asking me about it right before we got on, but you know, I was up there and, and we got our, we were two birds short of our limit. And the next day, uh, we got our limit with no problem. And a buddy of mine looked at me and goes, don't you think it's odd? We never saw another bird after we got our limit. Well, yeah, I have some suspicions on why. And we all do South Dakota. I mean, they can say they're all wild, but huh, amazing. We only saw exactly our limit. And, but I looked at my buddy and I said, are you really here to shoot the birds or do you care? And he goes, no, nah, that's just the excuse to come hang out with you guys. Cool. Yeah, there you go. I mean, so I don't care what trip I go on. Um, I'll even go fish with my friends yeah. and I don't even care for that that much. Yeah. I know, um, Ed, um, our buyer, Ed, which I'm sure, you know, he, he just yep. had a great experience at that same ranch this year. And I think he shot like 180 class inch muley saw some really cool ones too. Uh, even bigger, I think, but yeah, he, he, he really enjoyed his experience too. And as guys, you know, that can only shoot, you know, maybe 200 yards in a straight line here, it's, it's a different world out there for sure. When you get that opportunity to really take mm-hmm. a poke at something. So. Yeah, it's a different world. And I was with Ed when that happened. And, uh, you know, the other part of it that you don't think about, I don't remember what you guys' elevation is. Our elevation around here is 2,800, I guess. What is our elevation? Oh, uh, we're at that. 18, oh, it's 1,800. Yeah, we're a thousand. Yeah. Well, you go all of a sudden, you're at 65, 7,000, yeah. and um, carrying your rifle turns into a different deal. It's not not just throwing it over your shoulder. All of a sudden, I think it's really heavy at that elevation. Now, was he talking to you when he said, God, is that you? <laughs> he you told remember? us the pack out story. <laughs> he, he the pack out story. <laughs> I, I don't think he was talking. I think I was on my way back to help <laughs> he said, He said he was just laying down, and he was just like, God, just take me now. Just take me now. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> he didn't tell me that part of the story, but he, he he did. When he got to the truck, he was very, very happy. Oh, yeah. Shout out, Ed. That's a great muley. I'm, yeah. I'm happy for him. He's a, he's, a great, yeah. he's a great guy. Yeah. He is a great guy. Uh, Jason, you, you have known Todd for quite a while. Um, how did you guys meet up for the first time and become buddies? And maybe just talk about your relationship over the years. Well, Todd's not very smart, and so he needed some smart friends. And so I think his dad, his dad started paying me to be friends with him in about 1994. And um, finally, by 1998, I started waving the friendship dues. <laughs> and uh, I, make sure make sure you guys tell him I that. <laughs> uh, so I met Todd again at the SHOT Show in 1993. Um, Jeff Snook blew me off in the store in summer of 93. And... Um, Actually, my boss asked us, a guy named Kenny Berger, who is down there in Bell Fountain, or not Bell Fountain, Ohio. He's in New London, Ohio. Um, hell of a shotgunner. In fact, in his prime, he was probably one of the top 10 shotgunners in the country. And, and he taught me how to shoot a shotgun. He taught Todd how to shoot a shotgun. He taught Rich Vance how to shoot a shotgun. Um, and the way he kept me out of trouble, I was 23, 24 at the time. He was on weekends. Um, we went to a sporting clays shoot. We went to a trap shoot, something. And he'd started inviting Todd and Rich and me and a couple of others to go shoot sporting clays. And so we started shooting sporting clays. Well, Todd and I were the young pups in a room full of old people. And um, so we nat- naturally gravitated towards one another and, and started doing stuff around around Ohio. And because and, I lived in Columbus, I lived in – uh, first, I lived in New, not New Albany. I lived in Gahanna, and then I moved into Westerville, um, which yep. is where I lived, not very far from yeah. Todd. And uh, our wives were friends. And um, you, you guys mentioned Ryan earlier. I mean, I used to babysit Ryan and his sister. And um, I'll never forget one time after I moved, I went back to visit, and I was sleeping in the guest room, and I could hear Ryan and his sister Katie sneak up to my bedroom, and I heard Katie go, "Ryan, you know who's here?" He goes, "Who?" And Jason's here. And they ran in, and I mean, I was I was like the fun uncle. <laughs> there you go. And uh, um, 
yeah, we just hit it off. We have a lot in common. He and I are both third generation. Um, lots in common. Our dads are similar. We're similar in style. Um, you know, like I said, I just have to be a lot smarter than he is. <laughs> I mean, but but that isn't a whole lot of a challenge. I mean, oh you know, it puts me in the mi- middle IQ range. Notice how we're not saying and, anything uh, right now. Know. We're just like, oh. I notice you I'll just go, I'll just anything. go like, I, and I don't, I'll throw you under the bus. I don't care. Uh-huh. You know, and uh, uh, no, we just, we eat it off and we have similar interests. And, and um, oh, we talk probably every day, pretty close to every day. Although he was kind of grumpy yesterday, so I finally told him I didn't want to talk to him anymore. And uh, I love it. yeah, we're kind of like, we're, we're kind of like old ladies. We just, you'll hear us bicker and bitch. And we do this thing called the Sand Hills Open Road Challenge, which if you get a chance and you're a car guy, you should Google the SORC.com. It's a road rally we do out here in, in Nebraska where they shut the highway down. And um, you have 53 miles, you go back and forth. And Todd's my navigator. And one of these years, we're going to have to record our conversations in the car because, I mean, we just squabble like two little old ladies and, just, <laughs> and have a ball. What time of year is that that they run that? It is the second weekend in second August. Second weekend of August. Hey, mm-hmm. that's not too. And we've done it five. Yeah, we've done it five times and we've come in third twice. Is this just like a gumball rally kind so, of thing? No, so it is a rally, but that what it is is you. So on the main course, you go 53 miles, but you go 26 miles one way, and then you go the balance coming the other way. So they make you stop, and it's a windy road, and the goal is you have to be as close to 95 miles an hour exactly on the money when you finish. And uh, we were three-tenths of a mile an hour off and came in third. What are we driving? This sounds like a... Uh, we were driving... Yeah, it was fun. This year we were driving a Cadillac CT5 Blackwing, which is a. I'll do it. Uh, if you didn't, if you didn't know what it was, you, you wouldn't know what it is because it can be a sleeper car. You don't know the difference between a grandma's car and that and that Cadillac. But that one happens to have a little over 600 horsepower, so it, it moves pretty good for a grandma's car. But it's perfect because he he's kind of old. And so it's hard for him to get in and out of anything. Yeah, I mean he's driving the he's driving the trimmer, the, the, the trimmer though. I don't know if it's got automatic lift for him or, or what to get him up in there. <laughs> I, I want to make sure you know what you said. That, not me. <laughs> well, make sure my application is waiting just, for you. <laughs> not a problem. Preston needs some help. Is he? Uh, yeah, I was gonna say I'm throwing I'm lobbing all these things over there, but it just dawned on me that he's gonna be on one of these after me, so I got to be careful how I. I love it. He can get even, but just remember that anytime you have him on, I want to be on the next. Perfect. Time. There you go. We got it. So they can just go keep going back and forth. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. I, I'm interested as as a as a uh, bullet manufacturer and a guy that obviously you have the firearm side of things covered. Do you ever with all these hunts? Did you ever get into any type of archery work, archery type style, style hunts, or are you guys just being west, just typically go firearm? My my smart ass response is. Reusable bullets is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Um, you know, we're bullet makers, but uh, truth be told, when I was a rep in Ohio, and part of how I got to be friends with Todd is I was the Bear Jennings rep that called on Vances, and so um, I was the the guy who handled all of Bear Jennings. And at that time, which was um, in the early to mid '90s, that was one of the big brands. It was kind of Bear Jennings, PSE, and Hoyt were the really big ones. Um, Matthews started in on the scene kind of a little bit later than that, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's how we got to be friends. So yeah, I, I did, I, I think archery is really neat and, um, it's cool and I understand it all. It's just not, doesn't have to be what I do. And, um, my opportunities to go hunt and yeah. shoot are limited. So I tend to stick with what, uh, with what it is I have time for. Now I will tell you, my son's got a rig that he bought from you guys and, he shoots it all the time in the backyard, except he just started in college. So I suspect yep. archery is the furthest thing from his mind right now. Yeah. Um, he already got the thing on his mind right there, uh, the solo cup. <laughs> no, I don't think it's the solo cup. I think I think it's who's holding the solo cup, and it isn't an old white guy. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I yeah. kind of set that up because uh, I wanted, I'm curious because these guys get to hunt all sorts of crazy stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. So. 
Is there a particular, you know, everyone's very particular about what round they're using for what type of game. Is there, what is the Jason formula there for the mule deer? What's his ideal round? What's your go-to, you know, the elk round, the pronghorn, like what, what kind of rounds are you using for all these different types of game? <laughs> well, it's interesting that you bring that up because it, it does change. Um, you know, I have a rifle that I've had that I have bought from Vance's that is an able 30 out six Browning that is set up. And it's one of those ones where if somebody shows up or something happens and somebody needs a rifle, that is the go-to rifle that I just always know what's going to happen with it. And 30 out six is tried yep, and true and great, exactly. but I haven't hunted with it. I probably haven't hunted with it in 20 years. Um, the, until recently I was carrying a 300 RCM in a Christensen and that was a 20 inch carbon fiber barrel, um, you know, in a 300 RCM. Uh, so it's a short cartridge. And, and I was doing that because I was carrying it. It's a wonderful size. It's got great knockdown power. Um, in fact, I just figured out how to put a suppressor on it this last week. Um, and so that's a great rifle. She's finding that helps. Um, I have hunted with a 6.5 PRC probably for the last three or four years. Um, and I just happened to build a gun um, on a defiance action building uh, MDM stock. And um, I'm, I'm on my way to Spain here in a month. And I, I, I really like that thing for travel because it folds up and I got a smaller rifle case that I got everything cut out and I've got a really right stuff tripod and that that stock has already got an arca rail built into it and the tripod yep, does yep. and i think that might be the new the new travel rifle um but i'd be lying if i didn't tell you i had a uh seven prc show up last week um yeah. but a couple guys that are really good dudes uh built for me uh we've done some favors back and forth and for whatever reason they think i'm a nice enough guy that they built me a rifle and uh um it, it's from impact precision and it it's really cool so i i just literally um got it put together this week and uh i could see that being one that yeah. that if i'm not flying and trying to take a small case and it, it's a pretty compact rig too that's going to be the next go-to but i'm i will tell you my mindset now is if i can't hunt suppressed i'm gonna think about whether or not i want to go on the trip i'm i'm all in on suppressors at this point in time and i i just got my first batch oh about two months ago so i've been geeking out on all that stuff and it, and it's fun and it, you know it's funny because you ask those things and there's you go through transitions of shooting um most of my life i've been a heavy shotgun shooter and i still love shooting shotguns and, and then you go into heavy hunting and lately it's been long range and went through the three gun phase and the dipstick phase and um it's half the fun of doing what we do right is you you move from one to another it's, the thing is you kind of re look back at some of the things you did and go man i should start doing that again and we're all just kind of time limited oh, for sure for sure yeah i think uh, so this year for sure it's always been a slug for me here you know because obviously the white tail but that horny that horny yep. slug man she, Mm. I, the 350 yeah. legend definitely looks a lot more appetizing for me this year so if we go down the gun route if i don't get it down with my bow that's that's the ticket i think for me this year yep those slugs are those slugs hurt on both ends there's no oh, question definitely um you know the bush i i i'd look at the bushmaster more than the 350 personally yeah. but um i'm a little biased that way it's all good um yeah I don't know if you want to get into it. He mentioned Spain. So, um, you're outside of Spain. I think you, you, um, Ibex, is that, is that the Ibex hunt in Spain? I think uh -huh. Todd was talking about that the other day. Yep. Um, is there anything else yep. that you're looking forward to? I know you guys obviously already had some trips. Um, is there any more later season trips that you guys are looking forward to outside of the Ibex or is that about it? You know, that's going to be kind of the culmination of, uh, of everything for me. I, well, that's not true. Uh, next weekend's the opener of deer season here in Nebraska, and my son's a, a freshman at, in college down in Texas, and so he's coming back for deer season. So I am actually looking forward to sitting in 
the deer blind with him and, you know, kind of hearing about what he's got going on, but, uh, no, then you start rolling into next year and I don't, I don't have anything really planned until except for Turkey season. Um, a couple two years ago, year ago, I made a trip to Tajikistan, um, after an Ibex and I frankly screwed up and I missed. And, um, so I came home empty handed, but it was a, a unique place and a unique hunt and it's not terribly expensive. And, um, uh, and that was for mid Asian Ibex. And so I think I'm going to go back and do that. Um, the other thing that's good about if you put something like that on your, on your calendar, it makes you exercise more yeah. because you two guys look like you're in pretty good yeah. shape. I'm, I got the laptop hiding it. Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to talk to Preston about the angles of the camera and double chins. And that well, kind just of stay stuff. with your arms it's crossed right there mouth. and you look like you got some big guns. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but I, I'm sure we'll come up with something and, um, it's always fun to go. We try to make sure we go to Dallas Safari club show and run into people and usually you can come up with something. Um, a lot of times when we go on these trips, like the one you mentioned that Ed was on, I don't hunt anymore cause I, I've been fortunate enough to hunt that place yeah. enough. Uh, for me, it's more fun to go along with everybody else that's hunting sure. and you get to share those kinds of experiences. Not that I don't want to, but, um, you know, I got a really good elk. And uh, there's only so much wall space that, uh, you know, I don't, I don't need to go oh, kill another yeah. one if I'm not gonna mount him. And it's eating at that point in time, and yeah, um, I can wait till cow season. <laughs> there you go. Well, Ben, ben and uh -huh. I's calendars are usually pretty free in October. If you ever need someone to fill in your shoes for you, I'm just gonna rub my nose here real fast. <laughs> Um, hey, no problem. You want to come film? We're always looking for camera well, guys. That'd be cool. Pick your phone up and give him another text. <laughs> um, it's it's funny you mentioned in shape because he's gonna laugh at me, but we I actually have been putting in for uh, uh, speed goats over there in Wyoming, and I told him I wanted to get it done with the bow, and he's like, "Dude, I don't think we're in shape." I was like, "I'm bringing a rifle for doing that. I'm not trying to stalk." <laughs> you know, and there's ways and ways to do it where you can. Um, I watched a guy shoot one with a 44 mag pistol um, at about 80 yards. Yeah, it was fun. And I watched a guy shoot one with an antelope or an antelope with, with a bow and he was about 80 yards. That's a poke. He was a really, you know, really good. Um, it can be done, but, but it's a lot more fun with a rifle when you can yeah. <laughs> ground check, ground check them from 200 yards oh, away. Oh, for sure. I, I think that's, that's on my mm -hmm. list. And then I, I definitely, one of the, the more marquee, um, destination hunts, if you will, is the access doing the access mm -hmm. deer that would, I think yep. that would be a super cool, they're just yep. a super cool animal. So, and God bless Texas, God well, bless one, Texas one thing, for having all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can go do it all. But one thing you guys should be doing is you should be putting in for just put in for points right now. You guys are both really young, but start putting in for points. Um, it looks a little expensive, but you get your money back. You, you mean a point 35 bucks. They're going to keep your 280 bucks for a couple months, but they give it back to you. But those points stack up, and about the time that you're you have enough of them to draw, you won't be so worried about the two hundred eighty bucks. Oh yeah, for sure. No, I have um, four for for goats. I I, I kind of uh, shot my shot at a higher unit this year and missed. And then um, sec second yep. and third choices weren't really much of an option for people because of the herd numbers. Um, but I have right. four for mule deer as well as Wyoming. And then this Good. year I actually started picking up um, Kansas. Iowa, oh, Nebraska is over the counter, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then I, I made yeah, a count for you, South Dakota depends. as well. Well, you, you need to look at Colorado and you need to look at Utah. I would be putting in for those two states. If you like, if, if those things interest yeah. you, you should. You can always get an elk over the counter in Colorado, but putting in for the point costs you I, somewhere between 35, 55 bucks. And, and you can, you know, in a few years, 10 you can draw the unit of your choice and, and it, it, particularly mule deer. That's the, big I think one. that's honestly, I think mule deer are like intrigue me the more just, mm -hmm. I just, they're just, they're yeah. just awesome. They're, they're just awesome. They're just cool. They're the, they are the most majestic of the deer species period. Oh. And I love saying that the white Dude, guy. I, 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 honestly, we got one sitting right here. I, I would take a muley over him any day for yep. sure. For sure. <laughs> we were just in Todd's office the other yeah. day. I'm like, my draw is just like, yeah. 
Yeah, he's got some dandies in there in his office. We should film this podcast in his office next time. There you time. go. It's pretty small. We'll have to. <laughs> yeah, we don't need him. <laughs> we'll just kick our feet up on the desk. <laughs> there you go. I got no problem with it. So the, just to kind of wrap you up, man, uh, what kind of what's the outlook for the company moving forward? Um, are, is there anything else that you guys are excited about? I mean, obviously, you have the new release of products for next year. Um, but just looking forward, is there anything that you guys are also excited about? Uh, we just what we do and love talking to people. Like, I mean, find it. one of the things that um, is on that list that I don't think the whole world's picked up on, but we're going to have a 762 by 39 uh, subsonic load with a, a heavy long bullet that does expand and I think the the guys that have any of the 762 by 39 variants are just going to eat up um, and there's a lot of them out there um, we are messing with all kinds of subsonic stuff we're messing with a whole bunch of other things that um, yes we're excited about and no I won't tell you what they are <laughs> and uh, uh, right. you know but I, yeah you did and and uh I promise, you know, every, the thing is, is the last two years or last now call it three because 22 is wrapping up. Um, the last three years, it's kind of been one of those things of we've kept all our new product launches down to a minimum. And because we're, we've been so oversold, which is a, a good and bad problem because a lot of times guys don't understand why they can't find that box of 30, 30. And so we are looking forward to getting things things are slowing down and so we're getting back to a normal cadence where um we can make sure we get everybody taken care of before we we really turn on the gas on some new stuff and so um we we don't think customers will be disappointed when they go looking for hunting ammo in 2023 um you know barring we don't have another whatever in the last two years um so you know, we're, we're looking forward to making sure everybody is a little happier than they have been for the last couple of years. It's just been weird. And, uh, we, uh, we'll make more. So everybody keeps shooting. That's been our message all along. I promise we have not slowed down one bit and, and we're not planning on slowing down. We, we kind of like what we do. We like the space we're in. If you're looking for the cheap stuff, that's really not us. We're, we're more in the, the premium thing. If you, if you buy a new gun, I suggest you buy a box of ammo to plink with and a, a box of ammo to keep in your drawer or holster. And, you know, we, we're the holster guy and, um, that's, we're comfortable yep. with that. That's where my zombie is in my holster right now. Am, am I go. safe? And I bought it <laughs> 10 years ago. So I can't, I can't. There you go. Well now, 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 wait a minute. You, you should go practice with that a little bit and buy a new. Box. Oh, okay. There, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, I get a discount now. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm messing. <laughs> I, I, <clears throat> I would love to tell you it goes stale. I wish I could come up with a way to make it be like bread, where if you don't use it after so long, you need to replace it. But it's just fine. Got to have some freedom seeds. So, yep. awesome. <laughs> well, Jason, go. thanks for your time, man. I know you're a busy guy. At least that's what they tell us. And, uh, again, we, we appreciate you hopping on today. And, again, shout out to, to Preston for hooking us up and making yeah. our life a lot easier. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you guys asking me. And uh, we're happy to do this with you guys anytime. And, and uh, if you get an opportunity, I know that that guy running around there named Todd is is running around there. He's my best friend. Kick him in the shin for we'll me. Do. We'll do. Thanks, Jason. All right. Take care. Hey, oh, tell, him, tell, tell his dad he's late on the friendship, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds good, Jason. See you guys. All right, everyone. That is all we have for you today. We hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jason. We had a great time talking with him about the history of Hornady and, of course, those funny stories and that great friendship that he has with the Vance family. As always, we appreciate you listening. Stay safe this firearm season. And until next time, enjoy the pursuit.